Let us pray. Father, we bless your name and we glorify you. We know that you are with us. We know that your spirit is with us. And we know that the blood of Jesus will still cleanse from all unrighteousness. Lead us into the scriptures. Lead us out of the wilderness. Bring us into the rest of Canaan. Father, we are praying that in this church, marriage will be marriage. Amen. And the family will be a true Christian family. Amen. Where there is joy and love and peace and harmony. Where there is true sharing and fellowshipping together. Guide us today. Amen. The little we say, water it from above. Amen. Let it bear fruit. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yesterday we should have talked about the leadership in the home, which we have called the delicate position of leadership. And I want you to imagine yourself sick, and yet you don't know what is wrong with you. I want you to imagine yourself just not perfectly healthy, 100% healthy. And you don't know what is actually wrong with you, and therefore you have to visit a clinic. And uh, you have to sit before the doctor, and he just examines you. And he tries to see what is wrong, so he can make the prescription that he ought to make. And you know when you are there, because well, you are going to pay him for his services, and he likes you to come back again. You know, he is going to do the best he can do to help you identify the problem, locate the problem, and bring solution to the problem. Now, when marriage is not exactly what it ought to be, the solution is not with God. It's in God. And except you get into God, you never can find that solution. Jesus is not going to reign over your family. He is going to reign within your family. If it's just to reign from outside, if it's to control like a governor in his place of living, from outside, controlling the country, but he lives far away just to control, Jesus will not accept to do that. Therefore, he doesn't reign over you or over your family from a long distance. He likes to come in, sit down, have a central conspicuous place in that family. And then, from within, he controls. From within, he manages everything. From the within, he directs everything. So if we have been thinking that Jesus will reign over my family from a long distance, just sending messages to me, no, he wants to live right there. And um, the wife of a preacher called him one day and uh, said, Darling, he didn't know what the woman would say. Yes, my wife. And the wife said, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be wonderful if you are as nice as you are in the meetings? I mean, in the meeting, you are so nice. You counsel, you lay hands on the sick, you are so gentle, you are just the father of everybody, and you can't be the father of three at home. That it will just be, we don't want more. Just be as nice as you are in the meeting, that's enough for the family. And you know, sometimes too, that is it. We can preach faith to strangers, but not to the wife. We can endure for the backslider, but not for the wife. We can do all we can to sacrifice and to love. We can give hours without end. Ministering to strangers, to people we don't know. We just like to, we want to get them to heaven. But we like to stay, to go to heaven without our family following us. So you see, it's a delicate position we have in marriage. And um, I'm not going to beat about the bush. I'm not going to try to talk to the wife, talk to the husband, talk about children. I won't have all the time for that. I'm just going to talk to the men. Now, the women are here so that whenever you are 
just going up. Now you women understand. And if I go to the doctor and I say that, look at my hand, it's swollen up, and he wants to cut it, and uh, he just takes the knife, he cuts it, and then draws out the paws, I'll scream the roof of his hospital down. It'll be too painful. What does he do? He takes anesthetics, rubs it on, deadens that place, cuts it open, removes the thing, closes it up. By the time he closes it up, the feeling will come back again. You see, the wife, to remind the husband, you remember what they said at that time at the retreat? You remember that? You remember that? Before you do that operation, love is the local anesthetics. You put that love in. You sacrifice in love. And after that love, then you are ready for operation. To remind your husband, honey, you remember what they said? They said this and that. Because already you put the anesthetics, it's not painful. You put it without that love, it will be painful. And so the wives are here so that they can, you know, help their husbands. You love them, you understand them, you put the local anesthetics before you, you know, perform the operation. Then you remind them, after the love, you speak the truth only when you are in love. Speak the truth in love. Some people love to tell the truth, but it doesn't work. It's only when you tell the truth in love. You are close with love, your, your language is all loving, your attitude is love, your temperament is love, everything within you is love, then... You can remind your husband what was said. Now about the headship of the home. Let's see Ephesians chapter 5. You know, if I could quote a verse you have never read, I'd be so happy. I mean, if I just came and I read you and I said, is that in the Bible? I'd be so happy I was reading a verse you have never read. But it's unfortunate for me this morning. All the verses I'm going to read, you have read before. So you have to be very, very careful. Like um, a Baptist, excuse me, Baptist, and as like a Baptist who has not been saved but has been going to Sunday school all through his life and has been hearing, for God so loved the world, and he has not got saved. And now he comes into the meeting and the evangelist is preaching on salvation and he says, for God so loved the world, you lose him. He says, I know that already. He's not saved. I know that already. And so you see, sometimes the difficulty is we know the Bible, and now as I open Ephesians chapter 5, I have not said the verse, but you know it's verse 25. <laughs> verse 25 now. And I'm trying so as to get you relaxed. So I don't feel all tense up and I don't swallow the pill I'm going to give you. The gospel pill. God's pill. Now, Ephesians chapter 5. I mean there in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. You can only have a wife that you deserve. If your wife is bad, that's all you deserve. If your wife is good, that's all you deserve. If your wife is foolish, that's all you deserve. If your wife is wise, that's all you deserve. Christ makes the church the type of church he wants by his sacrifice. And the wife that you deserve is the wife you have at home. If she is not what she ought to be, sacrifice more. So you can have the type of wife you actually know you need. That's what this passage is saying. Husbands, love your wives. That you will love as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. For a purpose. So that he can sanctify that church and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. And then present that church to himself. Which type of church? The type of church he wants. 
he sacrificed so as to make that church available so as to present that church to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that that church should be holy and without blemish Christ loved the church in a realistic manner and that's why you have to love your wife your love must be realistic you say what does it mean for my love to be realistic well that's something that you can almost touch and feel and handle something concrete your love must be realistic as the love of Jesus Christ not the love of words not the love of uh, you know I love you empty words that carries no action with it the love of Jesus was realistic and so our love for the wife must be realistic and you know the love of Jesus was never diminished by anything the church did never the sick the more sick you are the more care Jesus will give the church the more dry you are the more Jesus will be present to supply the need of that dryness in your spiritual life there is nothing in the church that can decrease the overflowing of the love that is coming from Calvary and there should be nothing in the wife that should ever decrease ever decrease the love flowing from the husband to the wife it's realistic I'm assuming you are taking notes because this is uh, just about an hour's message but it will take a year before you can obey it fully because you know this is not automatic I've heard it I'll go and do it this one is different and so your love must be realistic nothing in your wife nothing she does nothing in her behavior should decrease that love husbands love your wives you know if, if the Bible had written husbands love your wife if they are saved if they are good if they are nice to have given us chance to maneuver to turn around it and give the excuse well my wife uh, is not lovable you realize when we were without strength Christ died for us when we were unlovable Christ loved us then the sacrifice of love is uh, very plain here he gave himself that's love love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that means one your love is realistic two your love is sacrificial do you ever sacrifice anything for your wife think about it can you sacrifice sleep for your wife your wife needs attention but you like to sleep and your wife says uh, can I talk with you? Don't you use ordinary common sense? I've been busy since this morning. I went out. I had to do this. I had to do that. And now you realize that I also preached tonight. And here I am. I've just come to the house. You should do the cooking. I just relaxed. And now you say you need attention. I'm sorry. But now after that, a new convert knocks at the door. She needs attention too. She is under persecution. And things are tense. And she knocks. Who is that? I am so and so. Oh, come in. Very nice man. Nice preacher. What do you need? I'm just, the persecution is so terrible. I'm having real trouble. Sit down, sit down, tell me. Because you know, she got converted last week and she mustn't backslide you give the next two hours to a counseling her and then your wife living at home with you cannot get five minutes of counseling you're always tired anytime your wife wants counseling that's the time tiredness will come anytime she needs attention that's the time you'll say ah ah understand now love your wife on the cross write it down that sacrifice your love will crucify you you love her to the point that actually your feelings are crucified 
Your motives were crucified. Everything is crucified and you are loving her from the cross, from the standpoint of the cross that sacrifice. So Jesus Christ loved the wife, uh, loved the church sacrificially. Now please. Wives too. In Timothy in Titus, you are told. In fact, the aged women are supposed to teach the young women to love their husbands. Love their husbands. Now, you realize that sometimes, as men, we have liberty and opportunity. When the wife is pregnant, you know, it's wonderful on one side that a child is going to be born. It's uh, not very nice, not very wonderful on the other side because, you know, the first three months, She's cooking your food and uh, all of a sudden she smells that uh, soup and then she goes to the sink and begins to vomit. And you, you look at her, the sink is very near the place uh, where she's cooking your food. And you say, what is all? Are you the first person to be pregnant in the world? <laughs> this is too much. And you know at that time that you will really need to love her. I mean that's the time I'm talking about. To actually love the wife. At that time she is not, you know, when the tummy is, you know, out and uh, the dressing is not as it ought to be. You know, she is not as beautiful as on the wedding day. I mean, let's face it. When something is attractive, it's easy to love that thing. When a woman is attractive, you are going to the altar. You don't hear this preaching on the wedding day, love your wife. Uh, you say, if I don't love her, why am I here? I love her. But you know, the time I'm talking about, when she's so tired, when she's in a special condition, or when she's sick, that's the time we're talking about. That you really need to be on the cross to love that wife. As a sacrifice. That's what the scripture is saying. As Christ loved the church, that he gave himself for it. Now you have had three children, four children, five children. And you're a preacher. And uh, here you are. You want to read the Bible? The children are making noise. Can't you take care of this, your children? I mean, when you want to read Bible, it's our children. But when they dress up and they look nice and you comb the air and you put on the tie and that little boy is walking and, uh, you know, somebody at the Bible study looks at the child and he says, this fine boy, this wonderful boy, whose child is this? How you come and don't you? Look at that, look at the face and look at the face. No, don't you know that's my child? I mean, when the child is well dressed and everybody in the fellowship is saying, This is just wonderful, just the replica of the fact that's my child now. But when you want to read the Bible and the children are making noise, that's her child, her children. And you know, at that time, if you are not very careful, at that time, you are not careful. What you'll do is just to find uh, another place in town. I mean, because God wants you to read the Bible. God wants you to pray. God wants you to be an effective, able minister of the New Testament. You'll go and you'll pack your load partially to another house. In the fellowship, not that you go to commit sin. You go to read Bible. You go to pray. To be with a bachelor somewhere. To live in another place somewhere. So that you can have time to read Bible. That's not love. That's selfishness. You want to know more Bible than your wife? Your wife needs more Bible than you do. She's going to take care of those children. That needs Bible. How can your wife go and live in another place wanting to study Bible? So as to teach the children. It's more difficult to raise children than to raise up a church. Your wife has a more difficult uh, assignment to do. Stay with that wife. The children are making noise, stay there. So that you can understand all the problems that your wife is going through. If your wife is pitching when pregnant, ask her, you need more toilet roll. Oh, now go and get a toilet roll. That's love. Leave your Bible, leave your fasting and praying. And what do you need? No water at home? Go for the water. That's what I'm talking about today. Sacrificial love. But you, at that time, you, when the children are there, instead of eating your part, you go and call your mother. Your mother is not saved. Who could be a witch? I mean, I'm serious here this morning. Who could have familiar spirit? Not born again. You go and call your mother to live in that place. 
instead of you and your wife taking care of your children. Then you go to call the unsaved, or you go to call nanny somewhere. Even nannies who are, who are in the fellowship, what Bible do they know? When uh, the child is uh, crying, what do they say? Have they studied how to take care of children? Which nanny will take five books on child training and child training and read because it wants to take care of your child? No nanny will do that. And if you are going to train children, this Bible, you must read every passage that, that is connected with children. In the Proverbs, in Deuteronomy, in Matthew, in all the New Testament. Which nanny will do that for you? But when you and the wife when you are able to handle the problem, you say, these are our children. I am making noise about it now because if Jesus tarried 15 years time, what we sow now in the home, we will reap 15 years time. Those children, they will smoke in their hands. They will destroy stones at the church like this. They will slap pastor because they are born in the church. They know all the full-time workers in the stage. Because the full-time workers have been coming, you know, to something. You mean, these are the children. We are bringing them to a workers retreat from the time they were born. And they are not taken care of. They know Brother Kumui. They know Brother uh, Shafet. They know Brother Akiola in Portaco. They know everybody. So if you say, well, uh, look nice. Look nice. How uh, about uh, Brother Kumui's child? Isn't, uh, are we not smoking the Indian home together? What do we mean by look nice? I mean, when Brakumi, Brakumi has to supervise the work in Nigeria, go to the east and go to the north and go everywhere. As to children, well, that's a small child. The child doesn't know anything. The child doesn't know anything. The child has become um, uh, a criminal before you pay attention. If you are preaching to the point you are not able to take care of the children, lessen the preaching. Go slow. Take care of the children. What I'm saying is that it's both of you together that will take care of the children. And you don't say, well, I'm being disturbed at home. Then you pack out. You are inside that house. You love that wife sacrificially. Sacrificially means you're able to sacrifice sleep. You're able to sacrifice the attention. You're able to sacrifice your prestige. Now you realize sometimes you've got married before you, have, you, have, you became a believer. And before you made and it's success in life. After your marriage, you went to a grade two teacher, a teacher training college. And your wife, you know, is still the same old modern three. But realize, listen to me, your wife is not grade two like you are because you cannot combine grade two teacher training and pregnancy. So realize that your wife has sacrificed education to raise up the children. Then after grade two, you take a, a level at home. You make it. You make it because you don't stay in the kitchen. If you have to cook in the kitchen, you will never get advanced level. You make it because you are not carrying pregnancy. So don't deceive yourself. It's not because you are brighter than the wife. The wife cannot make it because she is in the kitchen. She is carrying pregnancy. She is not in charge. Almost every two years, or for some poor, very, very lucky every year. And you know, <laughs> in such a case, the wife is so busy taking care of you, taking care of the house, taking care of the children. And now you go to university. All of a sudden you are a graduate and that woman is still her modern three. You begin to say that uh, we don't match. What do you mean you don't match? She is a slave doing the cooking carrying the pregnancy, nursing the children, to give you a chance to go to university. Now you come back, you don't realize that all your pay packet to come and lay down at her feet because she's the one that actually got that certificate. She's the one that allowed you to go up and down, go everywhere you want to go. And you pastors, before you, you know, have a large church like you have now, I mean, you are just an ordinary fellow. You say your wife doesn't know Bible. Uh -uh. If, you, if you have to cook, you have to raise children, you will not know Bible too. If you have to sit at home, clean the floor, clean the kitchen, wash the dishes, and bring up the children like she does, you too will not know Bible, but since you are free. I mean, uh, you and your shirt, <laughs> you are going. You will know Bible. Uh, if, I, if I'm like you, I will know Bible too. Because, you see, you have all the time to pray, 
to do anything. Wait. Then you know that the husband is the head of the home. Because he's the head of the home, he has one room apart, separate. Nobody can reach and nobody can touch. If the wife has a separate room like that, that no children can, can get there, no husband can get there, she's the only one having that key, ah, she'll become a Deborah overnight. But she doesn't. You put signboard on your door as husband. This place is under restriction. Nobody must come and disturb the minister of God. And you will become an Elijah. But wait a minute. You read about the wife of Elijah in your Bible? Children of Elijah in the Bible? Ah, if, if there is no wife, there is no child. You will be an Elijah overnight. You will pray your father. But Samuel had a wife. Samuel had children. You see the name of the wife there? The children, you see them following, uh, following Samuel, the first prophet of Israel? That means to sacrifice, means that you sacrifice your convenience. All those are untouchables, unenterable in the home, scrap it. That's love. You mean, brother, that uh, my wife can come to the room anytime, just disturb me? Oh, yes. While you are praying, she needs money to go and buy pepper, bro. <laughs> I need money to buy pepper. I know you are praying, but uh, <laughs> you don't have any money. It's hard. This is Christianity. First century. From the Bible. Marriage is not a joke. It is sacrifice. You will sacrifice your very life. For that woman. And then Jesus loved the wife purposefully. You know there's purpose in love. Realistically. Sacrificially. Purposefully. He loved why? Because it says that he might sanctify and cleanse it. In verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. That is a purpose in love. Now what's your purpose in your love? To bring deepened unity. It will take thought. It will take prayer. It will take work. It will take patience and persistence. Now you know something? Your wife studies you. If she doesn't, she'll never be able to cook your food. She may study a book, a cookery book, but she needs to study you on your appetite, on what you like, on what you don't like. Because she doesn't know you were brought up. She doesn't know what type of food you normally like, what mommy will cook for you when you are much younger and you want that same thing now. She has to study you. No, she has to study when, if she's a good wife, when your clothes are dirty. To wash them, iron them, get the thing done properly. She has to study a number of things about you to be able to please you and meet your need. And you have to do the same thing before you can please your wife and actually love her the proper way. You have to study your wife so that your love will not be misdirected. You will be able to love purposefully when you have studied her and then you will be able to give her the time and the thought and the attention, the prayer, the work, the persistence and the patience that is necessary. Now, you love willfully. That's number four. Realistically, sacrificially, purposefully, willfully. With no motive or motivation outside of Jesus Christ, he loved the church. He willed to do it. He determined to do it. He purposed to do it. And therefore he loved. Love is not sentimental. Love is a determined action that you take towards your wife. Love will deliberately close eyes to what things are not as nice as you like. Love will deliberately speak in wisdom. Love will deliberately speak so as to help the wife, encourage the wife. It's a willful thing. Where there is no will, where, is, where there is the will to love, there will arise the feelings of love as well. But you don't love just because you feel. 
You love because you're determined to do it, because you will to do it, because you purpose to do it. Therefore, he loved willfully. We must love willfully. And then, number five, he loved absolutely. He loved the church absolutely. It wasn't a limited love. It was without limit, without condition, without reserve. When we love the wife, there must be no limit. When we love the wife, there must be no condition or strings attached. When we love the wife, there must be no reservation. And that means we love her in all areas of her life and involvement together. And um, those of you men who are sitting inside, you are working. I want you to answer this question privately in your heart. Does your wife know how much you receive in the place of work? Well, she doesn't. Why? You need to know my wife. If she knows that this is how much I receive, everything will finish in one week. So I just know that it's useless telling her. Aren't you a failure then? Because a wife has been living with you for one year, two years, you can't teach her financial management. Aren't you ignorant yourself? Because I've told you before, you have the type of wife you deserve. If the wife doesn't know how to manage money, sit her down. Teach her. If you teach her, she will understand. Because the grace of God is available. So when you receive your money, your salary, or you are a trader, you've got the money, you put everything. This is, there's no reservation in law. And uh, are there some untouchable areas of your life that your wife can never ask? But you know, when there is uh, no skeleton in the cupboard, I mean, we just throw it open. Now, somebody has written a letter to you, especially a lady. Well, just to convert. Just somebody I knew before that I was counseling. I mean, nothing serious, nothing private. And then this letter came in the letterbox before you actually came in. And uh, your wife said, ah, this is an interesting writing. This one writing is fine. Looks like a uh, writing of a lady like myself. And then opens it and reads it. And then you come back and uh, you say, then she says that uh, you have some letters. And, uh, you know, some of them are just uh, things that are tight. Others are real letters. And, uh, well, I opened one or two. What do you mean? Oh, I thought we were husband and wife. Uh -huh, therefore... Well, anyway, in any case, I've made a mistake already. I opened this one, and this one is, uh, I'm surprised, this one, the way she is talking. And she knows you are married. That's what I'm saying. Never read my letters. Your love has reservation. There are some letters you can receive. Not letters, not just because of the ministry, not just because a convert is writing to a leader, but because there is a clause in that letter she mustn't know. There is a type of writing. I mean, when a convert is seeking for counseling, there is a plain way she writes. The problems are there. But uh, all the other parts, brother, I need this counseling, and I just want to remind you I love you so dear. <laughs> Real counseling, that is not there. I mean, a wife should not read a letter like that. There will be trouble at all. But your love must be without reservation. That there is nothing you are hiding from the wife. I mean, anybody that has spoken to you, you have discussed anything, the person should be free to talk to your wife. State representatives. I'm not throwing any bomb. I'm only saying that your wife is the closest person to you in the stage. Man or woman, the closest person to you in the stage. On the work of the ministry, on the approach to counseling, on anything. Anybody wants to see you, they are, very, they are free, or totally free to see your wife. Because, I mean, your wife is living with you. They can send your wife to you. I just wanted to see the situation on this problem. This is what I want to discuss. I mean, you are counseling in the sitting room. Your wife has to pass. There, is no, there should be no law in the home. Where there is real law. I mean, the wife can, you know, quietly pass. Will not disturb you. After all, you are typist. While you are counseling and come to you and say, bro, uh, that letter you told me to type, is it on the stencil or just on the tidied paper? Your typist can do that without you raising an eyebrow. 
If your typist can come in when you are counseling, if your typist can pass on, just pass uh, along while you are counseling, uh -uh. otherwise in prison, do, do they become unlucky because they have married state representative or married a preacher? They must be free. That's, this is the Bible and this is law. If it is not like that, there is no law. If there is reservation, if there is something we are hiding, if there is something we are covering with a blanket, love is missing there. The love is absolute. Well, the wife is a Christian, is a child of God, and hopefully she is not going to come and just disturb you and say, I had at the workers retreat that, uh, you know, while you are praying, I can just bring money for Pepe. I mean, if she takes loss into her hand because of that, maybe she has evil spirit. But you see, we're just saying that these are opportunities we have so that we'll really be husband and wife at home. Love one another. Be free with one another. Be able to talk our minds out between ourselves and our wives. I mean, if you... How would you feel? I mean, as a real preacher, dynamic, deeper life preacher, you're just coming into the, uh, into the auditorium. We're ready to preach on a... Friday, miracle revival hour, and your wife meets you. And you are, I mean, you want to minister the miraculous power of God. And here you are coming with the fire of God upon your heart. And your wife meets you. Can you smile? Ah, no. How can you smile to your wife in public? That's backsliding. <laughs> I mean, when you want to manifest the power of God. To really be dynamic for God. I mean, the moment your wife sees your face and sees the fire of God in your face, <laughs> one way lane, <laughs> she goes to another place. That's not Christianity. That one is being sanctimonious. That one is pretense. I mean, you see your child at the fellowship center. You can uh, hold your wife and your child is saying, Daddy, Daddy. Mary, take this child. This is what I'm telling you. <laughs> I mean, as a fellowship, while I want to preach with the power of God upon my life, look at this child saying, Daddy, I'm taking him away. <laughs> marriage. Deeper life marriage. That's not Christianity. It's a crime to laugh, to smile with your wife. I mean, say, you know, I just met you and wanted to ask a question just for one minute. I mean, even the ushers have more power than your wife in the fellowship. I mean, they can come to you, bump at you, and they can tell your wife, uh, uh, I just want to see bro. Which bro? Uh, no, this, this one, this is fellowship center. You cannot. You've given your usher so much power like that. That even your wife is under everybody. And she must, it's like in the army. Obey first and then complain. And she obeys first and there's no time to complain. Because at home she cannot talk. In the fellowship she cannot talk. <laughs> you want her to die. Don't you know that lack of love can give a person sickness, depression, and just make her die prematurely? Or deeper life has another wife for you if you kill that one? We must be very careful. Our love must be sacrificial. Now I'm looking at uh, First Peter. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife. Have you ever read that in the Bible? I mean, we give honor to God. We give honor to Jesus Christ. And we give honor to the leader. But to the wife? No. But the Bible says, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor, giving honor, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. What does that mean, weaker vessel? Does that mean it's, uh, her salvation is not as serious as the salvation of the man? No. Does that mean she's not able to manifest the sanctification experience as the husband? No, sir. Does that mean she's not able to manifest the power of God in prayer as other people? No, sir. It's telling you something basic. The tears of women are closer to their eyes than men. You may not understand, but just write it down. 
I mean, you touch them like this, the tears will flow. It's like a pipe. You just, uh, you just turn it like this, and the tap will be running. That's the weaker vessel. She feels. I mean, little, little things she'll never think about will make anybody to feel anything she'll feel about it. She'll be, un she'll be unhappy about it. And it distorts her prayer life. It distorts her attitude, her relationship with people. And you know, when a wife is unhappy from the home and she comes to the fellowship, everybody will think that she's a devil. Sister is never happy. It's not her fault, it's the fault of the husband. If the husband makes her happy, she'll be happy. Women are the easiest people to make happy on the face of the earth. I mean, give only a little peppermint to her and she's happy already. <laughs> I'm sorry, please, I'm sorry. <laughs> And yet they are the most uh, the easily offended people. I mean, do it. Just uh, take a little five cover away from the money for the food. You don't explain why. Already they are unhappy. I mean, very easy to be pleased and made happy and made to laugh and made joyful and very easy to offend. That's a weaker vessel. And you must deal with them with understanding, with knowledge. Because that's your wife. And... Uh, I'm sure you, are go you want her to get to heaven with you. And says, as being heir together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. That your prayers be not hindered. Now you, you wonder why there may not be all that you need in your ministry to pray, to bring the power of God down. Maybe the source of the hindrance is the home. Maybe your prayers have been hindered because there is no unity and there is no love, there is no harmony in the home. Only seven things I want to point out of this passage here. One is tenderness. You ask in tenderness to your wife. Do not demand that the wife do exactly as you do. You know, sometimes that's the problem we have. We want our wives so to do exactly as we do. Oh no, you are a man, she's a woman. You are organized, she's disorganized, self-centered. If you show disapproval when things go wrong, why not show appreciation when things go well? You know, when things are wrong, the food is not good, we talk. The ground is not clean, we talk. The children are dirty, we talk. Uh, money goes past, we talk. When things are bad, we talk. But when things are good, we keep quiet. That means you are not balanced. If you talk when things are bad, you must talk when things are good. Avoid a domineering be a behavior. I mean, avoid uh, making it look like there's a lion and a sheep in the home. And the sheep, if she doesn't want to destroy herself, must always live in the cage. Because the lion will have that domineering spirit. It must not be like that. Let it be like sheep and sheep. The strength of character is above physical strength. Sometimes the strength we manifest as husbands is just the physical strength. That should be the strength of character. Number two, there should be common politeness in the home. Any marriage will be successful if the husband and wife was polite to each other as they are to total strangers. So, be polite to your wife. And your wife, you, I hope I've not lost you in the crowd. You also ought to be tender towards your husband. You also ought to be polite towards your husband. Show consideration, which you expect uh, in a large measure from her. There should be sociability. That means you should be able to laugh at home when things are funny. I mean, just, just laugh it over. You said, my, my wife, I just like the, a toast this morning. You women, you don't know what is a toast. Ask other people when I finish. That means, you know, you bake or you uh, burn the bread a little. You got it. But you know, while your wife is putting that uh, bread there, she's going to fix the diapers for the child. Then she remembers that you need to get water to bath, and then she's gone for that. By the time she comes back, that thing is totally burnt. 
must say, you know, she doesn't want to start all over again because you are rushing to the office. She puts everything there. Now, the whole thing is burnt, your breakfast is spoiled. If you are not careful, that can spoil the whole day. Because you get moody, you get unhappy, you get fat, you show it. By the time you get to the office, you remember that because the morning is very, very important. If the morning is clear, the whole day will be clear. But if the morning is cloudy and gloomy, the whole day will be cloudy and gloomy. And now the bread is burnt. So what do you do? You say, my wife, I mean, you just make fun of the whole thing. Just make, make her laugh and you laugh about it. That uh, today we, when Leviticus were presenting a burnt offering to the Lord. <laughs> and she says, uh, what do you mean? I, well, I just mean that, uh, you know, today I just sacrifice this. Just give it to the Lord as a burnt offering. <laughs> then she will get what you are saying, but you know there's no quarrel, there's no fighting. You just laugh about it. You drink orange or water or something, you are gone. And your day is clear. Your mind is clear. You are happy. No, the wife can never make you sad. She does anything, maybe she turns on the stove and the whole thing is very hot and you know, it's very warm at home. And uh, you see there, and there's nothing, the fire, on the fire, the water has boiled and boiled and boiled, but the water is dry, it's only the pan that is just, a, that is just a being fried. Nothing in the same, because the woman puts the water there, pan on the fire, high speed, and then she's gone to do other things. She's forgotten everything. By the time you see it, the whole kitchen is hot. As if it's going to just burn up. Now if you, if you don't put the thing off, you say, Come on, <laughs> come and look at you. This is what I'm saying. When we are saved, our brain will be affected. <laughs> but we just have this coconut there, there is nothing. We put, we put water on fire, everything else, look at it. Look, you look at it. That's okay. Hey, if I talk now, you say you want to counsel people. You want to counsel people. Ordinary water on the fire, you can't do. You want to counsel. The wife will feel like a square peg in a round hole. Because ne nothing good about her. Her dressing is bad to you. Her language is bad to you. Her cooking is bad to you. Taking care of the house is bad to you. Everything is bad to you. If she doesn't commit suicide, it's because if they hear, what will they say? That's the only reason. But you know, the whole place is hot and you come in and you say, come and look at this. And then she enters. You see how hot? To spend five minutes here will be terrible. But thank God we have escaped hell. I mean, just draw a lesson out of it. If it can be so hot like this, with only a kettle on the fire, hell will be very hot. And thank God, we are not going to hell. Then you put all the things. She has got her lesson. But you know, you are humorous at home. Everything is full of joy. Anything she does, you are able to turn it around and laugh about it. Just enjoy yourself. That's marriage. <laughs> but the marriage that we uh, are almost uh, putting almost uh, this uh, kodje, or what do you call it? Weep at home. Now you say you don't have weight because you are, you are deeper life. Because deeper life people, they don't beat their wives. You see, my father used to use this thing. He'll whip you. My mother, never. But my mother, her tongue is as long as my father's whip. She will talk. When she talks, you know you are bad. My, my father, he will not talk. He takes it out. I mean, he's a man, he doesn't have time. <laughs> once, he's got, once you've got it, you go and sit down. But the same thing with my mother. No cordial, no weep, but the tongue will do the same work. Husbands outside who are not born again. Denominational husbands. They use the weep physically. Deeper life people, we don't use the weep. No, if you are born again, you can't beat your wife. But the tongue is as long as the weep. We we'll slash them, we we'll beat them, a number of things that people do. And so the wife will just go to the toilet because if she goes to the room, you call her. Ah, so that, that thing that we talk, that's why you went to the room and locked the door. Ah, <laughs> this examination you have. Examine it all. <laughs> so she will not go to the room, she goes to the toilet. 
You will think that she's making use of toilet. What's she doing? She's crying. Praying God. And you say we cannot divorce. And we cannot live separately. God, when are you coming? When is Jesus coming? So I can be out of all this. In the fellowship, I'm not able to do anything. He says, I don't know Bible. And true, I don't know Bible. How can I know Bible? Can you know Bible if you study Bible with a confused mind? If you are sorrowful and you carry Bible, will you understand? If you are depressed and unhappy and sad, and you go to take Bible and read, will you get any word out of it? If the wife is always bad, always rebuking her, always there is a problem, and she's always saying, I'm sorry for every day at night before she sleeps, because she wants a tender conscience. Every night before she sleeps, the duty of the day is, bro, I'm sorry for the one in the afternoon, or the one in the morning, or the one in the evening, or the one at the fellowship, or because I kept late at the market or because the food wasn't ready. Every night, the duty of the day must be done. I am sorry. And the husband, never sorry. I mean, he's the husband. He's the, you know, the head of the home. That's why we put it, the delicate position of headship. That thing can send you to hell in two minutes to be a head of the home. There should be sociability. You know, love one another, be jovial with one another, help one another. There should be understanding. Understand, so, understand your wife's temperaments and peculiarities and be patient. Our feelings fluctuate. Now I'm going to ask you some questions. Uh, you men. After you became a husband, did you ever get any book to read on the anatomy of the woman, on pregnancy, her feelings, and things like that? <laughs> you see? Why do I read all that? That's her business. She ought to read that so as to know how to take care of her pregnancy. That's the problem. You don't know how she would feel at a particular time. When she looks depressed, you have no answer because you don't understand how she feels in the body. You don't know the things that affect her. But you should understand your wife's temperament and peculiarities. You say, but if I don't have any books to read, you have the best teacher at home. You say, oh, is that your wife? I'm the best person to teach you how I feel. You can't read in a book. You can read general things about it in a book, but I'm the best teacher to tell you how I feel when this happens. How I feel when this happens. And your wife is the best teacher on her feelings. She wants to pass across to you how she feels when this happens. That's the best teacher. She is the one. If you allow her to talk, she will tell you. And uh, you do it after this message. I don't mean here because there's not much time here. But when you get back home, See, all that that bro was preaching, I count it as theory. Uh, how do you see it? Ah, your wife will say, you count it as theory, but you are saved. And she, he said that uh, sometimes uh, a little sin will make you happy, a little sin will make you unhappy, and you are saved and sanctified and baptized the Holy Ghost. Is it true? Your wife will say, sit down. I will lecture you this time. <laughs> because, you know, we take them for granted. We don't understand. But must have understanding. There must be fairness in financial matters. After you've written it, look up at me. You know, long ago when I was uh, a bachelor, sometimes I had time to cook, sometimes I didn't have time. But you know, whenever I went to the market, if I went on my own, I put an arrow in my pocket. When you come back, you come back with something. And when you are a bachelor on your own, you just go to the general market there, 10 naira, 20 naira you take, you go to the market, you buy vegetable, you buy onion, you buy everything, you buy uh, magi cube, that's what you call it. I have not forgotten. <laughs> you see, you buy all this, 20 naira, everything is there, garage is there, rice is there, 20 naira. And now you've got marriage. This is 1984. And you stop going to market. You call your wife. The 20 Naira of 1976. <laughs> That's what you bring out. You say, Harbour. Take care of it very well, no? Because <laughs> there's austerity. <no. laughs> then she takes 20 Naira. And it will not cook soup. Since you have said she should uh, take care of it very well, she goes to find dried fish. The one that was almost spoiled, I'll be saying, and they just dried up for you. And then puts it in the soup. 
You eat it and you say, ah, <laughs> what is this one? <laughs> she said, that is 20 naira. <laughs> you get unhappy. This one has no nourishment, no vitamin. You want vitamin? Bring out naira. <laughs> Things have changed. I recommend when you leave this place, next week, go to the market with your wife. Let her give you the list of what to buy. Vegetable, onion, pepper, meat. Just go with her. Do it yourself. Just once, please. But please take up to 50 naira with you so you don't get disappointed. <laughs> buy those things yourself. You will understand things have changed. No more 1970. This one is 1980. 84, thank you. Things have changed. The market has changed. A tin of milk before, 20 cobbles. I mean, many, many years, from years ago. When was it 20 cobbles? You women, tell me. Talk now. <laughs> what? January 83, 20 cobbles. What is it now? 70 cobbles to one naira. Within one to two years, and you are still giving 20 naira for food for one week. Things have changed. So that means we must be fair in financial matters in our marriage. Then, please, number six, private correction, public commendation. Now, look up at me here. Have you ever found a doctor you... I want to have an operation. And then he, he tells you, well, Nepal has taken away light, come out here. And right at the premises of the hospital, as people are passing and going, he says, remove your shirt. Begins to examine you. Then he puts on the anesthetic there and then cuts you. Right in the open, as people are passing. Did they ever do that? Never. Correction is like an operation. Now, you think about it, human. When you are here and I correct you openly, even though you are a man, I'm a man, how do you feel? You feel a little bit unhappy. You feel a little bit of shame because of other people. But if I called you, I said, please come. And we walk far away. And then I said, my brother, look at this one. This one is not good. This one is not good. How did you do it like this? You say, my brother, I'm sorry. In private, you'll be corrected, you'll say, I'm sorry. If I call you here, just say, Brother Samuel, well, you stand up, and then you stand up. Why did you do this? Immediately, the way you respond is, you'll find a way to defend yourself, because there are other people around. I had the state representative yesterday, you didn't know what I was going to do. I said, state representatives, come out here. Your mind went this way, that way, that way, that way. <laughs> What's he going to do? Because this boy is, uh, is like a criminal. <laughs> you can't tell what he's going to do. Because everybody fears public correction. But we do it to the wife every day. We slaughter her publicly. Cut her open publicly. Every day. In fact, sometimes, uh, you know, as we're here now, you're leading Bible study in your location. And your wife is just coming in. But wait a minute. You must think, why is your wife just coming in? If before you left home as a Bible study leader, you went to dress the child up, you cleaned out, you helped her to take her back. That's the love I'm talking about, sacrificial love. You took her back, you put her Bible there, you, you brought her scarf, you put everything there, you put water, my sister, bath. This is water. If you do that and she does the bathing, she takes her bag, which you are packed, you get into the car, she rides in your car with you. She will not be late. But when you are the car owner and you get into the car and then you are the back as the car owner, the landlord of the whole, of the whole city, and your wife is the one that will dress the child, clean the child, do everything, she will come late at least once in a while or perhaps every time. And then she's just coming in. And you know why she's coming in late. 
And now since you are the head and the leader, and as a preacher, when the preacher is preaching, nobody else can talk. And as you're just coming in, and you want to be firm in this ministry, you want to be a real leader in that ministry, you don't want anybody to come late, and this is your wife laying a bad example. Uh -uh. You are the one laying a bad example. If you did what you should do at home, she will not be late. And then you say, look, everybody look, look at her. That's the preacher's wife. Just come in to fellowship now. We have sent crosses. We have given announcements. You people have told you heaven. And I've told you not to come late. Don't see the example of anybody. Pastor's wife doesn't get us to heaven. That I am state representative's wife. That doesn't get anybody to heaven. See her now. Therefore, I'm telling you, don't look at anybody's example. And they, hey, come in. Come, sit down, sit down. The little you are able to hear. If it benefits you, thank God. She will not hear anything at the Bible study. Her head will be turning. Her eyes will be dizzy. She will be sweating. Her blood pressure will rise. She will be afraid. She will be doubtful. She will be thinking, did I make a mistake in choosing this man as the will of God? We are killing these women. And they are dying. You test it. They get more sick than we are sick. I mean, we, we men, what are you sick about? Her life is intact. But that woman is already becoming old. I mean, look at, as you are sitting down here now, you say you are men. Look at your face as fresh as you are. Some of you, 40, you are fresh like 25. L let your wife become 40. And look at her face. She is pining away. I mean, sometimes, you know, the, the man, look at me now. You can tell I'm married. You see my chest? <laughs> you, know? you know, women, I mean, you just sit down, you eat, you say, my dear, where is the orange? You drink orange. <laughs> where is the purple? You take purple. And you will get fat. <laughs> but go and look at the woman. The color bone here, this one here is what you call color bone. It will come out like this. You see how you say, this one, ah, ah. God have mercy. The same orange is there, you can, it's only husband that can drink orange. If wife drinks it, ah, ah, you are getting spoiled. <laughs> You're drinking orange, this is austerity. <laughs> Taking purple. But the man, ah, uh, ah, uh, the man is the head of the house. And the head must eat everything. The head must change the dress. Take care of himself. But the wife, there should be private correction and public commendation. Never, never slash your wife outside. Never, please. Not only in the meeting, uh, going on the road and there's another person in the car with you, never do it. Reserve it, make it private. Wash your dirty clothes inside. When you do it, do it with real care because criticism, it kills. Even when it is constructive, it's very, very hard. It's like putting salt into your eyes. Water will come out. It's like, you know, when I was uh, I'm much, much younger than this, the people I was living with, they said I wasn't treating my books well. You know what they did? They put uh, pepper inside, uh, inside water and rubbed my eyes with it so that I will not sleep, so that I will read. I didn't sleep, but I wasn't reading. I was thinking which wicked people are they. And when you criticize publicly like that, your wife in particular, I mean, the wives never do that. Never. They don't have the opportunity. Can they come on the pulpit? Or while they are teaching, start the scripture. You divide into groups. And your wife is teaching one of the uh, groups of study scripture. And she, she knows your faults. I mean, who doesn't have fault? Is there anybody here who doesn't have any fault at all? Are there angels here? Everybody has faults. If anybody knows your faults, your wife knows your faults. When she's teaching the scripture, can, he, can she come out and uh, while teaching her own small group and uh, begin to talk about, you know, Christianity, sanctification, and then he will not, she will not find any example to use from the market, from the farm, from everywhere. The only example she can find is the husband. 
Which wife has done that in this ministry? No wife. They are more respectable than we are. They are more conscious than we are. They are very careful. They love us. But we, we don't find any other example. It's they we find. We slash them. So that is the thing we're saying. If you're a real husband, there must be private correction. And let it be few. You know, don't every day correcting, every day correcting. Be happy with her. Commend her for things that are good. There should be honesty and truthfulness and being straightforward. Honesty. Truthfulness. Straightforwardness. Now my, my time is gone, therefore I'm going to just do some things now. I want you to write husband down. And if you don't know how to spell husband, you raise up your hand and I'll do it for you. Because I am one and I know how to spell it. You write husband down, but write it downward. Uh, no chalk here. Any chalk around here? Chapel, you have no chalk. You've forgotten how to teach. <laughs> uh, Ralph, how can I have chalk? Everybody say, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know what Job said? Job said, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a mage? And that's in Job chapter 1, verse 1. After he's got married and got children, in fact, many children. And uh, for men to be holy in conscience, they have to keep away from all ladies, all women. There must be no nothing of any secret, personal feeling between you and any other lady. You must be holy in conscience. That's a real husband. H. Understanding in conversation. Sorry, you. Understanding. You, sorry. Understanding in conversation, correction, and criticism. Have we written that? Now, as I've been talking on conversation, on her talking together at home, on correction or criticism, in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 23, a man has joy by the answer of his mouth. And in what spoken in this season, how good is it? I've already told you that when you correct or criticize your wife publicly in the presence of other people, it's like slashing her, cutting her, and it's like pouring sulfuric acid on her. Sharp, sudden criticism is an arrow thrown at the heart of the wife. Uncontrolled, thoughtless, explosive disagreement with accusation and criticism will destroy love, destroy fellowship, will destroy creativity and initiative and joy. Now, I heard of a type of plant. I think it's um, the Indians that do it. They want this uh, type of plant to be kept to size. So they have a way. Thank you. I've got one. They have a way of uh, trimming the top. Now, have you ever seen uh, people trimming the top of flowers? Yes, yes you have. But this thing, they have, they have a way of digging around that particular type of flower. Then they take it out. They trim the underneath. They cut the underneath, the roots, and then also trim the top. And then they plant it in that same position again. Next year again, they'll dig it out. And just, they like to keep those things in a proper shape. They cut down to size. And what I'm asking you is, if you cut your wife at the root and at the top, she'll remain at the same size. She'll never grow. Criticism. Public correction. It's like cutting her above, cutting her below, cutting her privately, cutting her, uh, you know, publicly, cutting in the fellowship, cutting with your family. When your mother is there, your father is there, her people are there, just cutting on her, cutting on her, cutting on her. She'll never grow. She'll just be in that size. You see, does that mean I, we can never correct? We can correct. 
But I'll give you 12 points on, keep, on keeping your correction constructive and positive. Number one, when something goes wrong, don't just assume you know who is at fault. But whenever things go wrong at home, you know, we just decide immediately, I know it's my wife that is wrong. No, it may not be your wife. So number one is, when something goes wrong at home or anywhere, don't just assume you know who is at fault. Give her the benefit of the doubt before she talks. Number two, get the facts, not supposition, before you speak on the issue or the problem. Number three, make it clear to her just what is wrong. Don't pull in a number of other things. And that's how you did this last week. That's how you did that last month. That's how you did that last year. Don't pull in other things. Just pinpoint what is wrong and make it clear to your wife, or well, to your husband, or to your wife, just what is wrong. For manifest love and control your temper while you're speaking to correct her. Don't criticize an attitude of pride, arrogance, or anger. Speak to her in private, personally, never openly. Number six, praise her. Find something to comment. Show interest in her welfare before you criticize. I told you before that love is a local anesthetic that allows you to perform the operation on your wife or your husband before you criticize or correct love first. Number seven, share your part of the blame. I know you are not all getting it, but you'll get it from those who can write short hand when we finish. Number seven, share your part of the blame. Take responsibility for her mistake when it is possible and mean it sincerely. Tell her you know an area where you have contributed to that fault of hers. Number eight, leave me to her side of the story. Create a good atmosphere for her to talk. Number nine, protect her dignity and personality, please. That's as you are correcting or criticizing if it's positive criticism. Number ten, suggest specific steps to prevent the recurrence of the mistake. Suggest specific steps to prevent the recurrence of the mistake. Eleven, pray for her and pray with her sincerely and in faith. That is, after correcting her, don't let her go like that just with sorrow and sadness. Just pray together after the correction. Assure her again of your love after the correction. Number twelve, forgive and forget. There are no grudge, let love continue. Now, that's understanding in conversation, correction, and criticism. Now, A. Strong in caring and compassion. Strong in caring and compassion. Remember, we are spelling husband. Because if any of this is missing, that's not a real complete husband. And that's what we are taught in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 28 to 33. A strong in caring and compassion. The same thing in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 7 to 10. Be blameless in conduct at home and abroad, when your wife is with you and when your wife is not with you. Blameless in conduct, that's B for the husband. That's Philippians chapter 2 verses 14 to 16. A, abiding in the covenant, you have made a covenant for better for worse, abide in it. 
You've made a covenant until death do us part, abide in it. Abiding in the covenant. Malachi chapter 2 verses 14 to 16. And Matthew chapter 19 verses 4 to 6. And noble in courage. First Samuel chapter 17 verses 34 and 35. Noble in courage. That passage is talking to you about David, how he protected the sheep, animals, so courageously. And if he protected animals that way, how courageously should you protect your wife? You protect her against all dangers, all dangers of gossip, all dangers of society, all dangers from in-laws. You protect her. D, dependable for contribution at home. First Timothy chapter 5 verse 8, if any man does not provide for his family, it's more than an infidel, more than an infidel. And 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 14 and 15. Dependable in contribution. Husbands, what is age? What is you? What is S? What is B? A. N D Think about it. If anybody is just like that every day of the year, that's all the husband and the wife need. They don't need more than that. You are holy in conscience, you are understanding your conversation, increasing and correction, you are strong in caring and compassion, you are blameless, you are abiding in that covenant and you are faithful to it, you are noble and courageous as to defend and protect them, you are dependable in contribution, that's all they need. Now, wives, let me come to you. You write W I F E downwards. Have you done that? If you write small W, that means you, you feel you are a small one. <laughs> write big W, that means you know you are a real one. Now, W means wise in communication. What does Proverbs say in chapter 14? Proverbs 14. Verse 1. Every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish plotteth it down with her hands. In chapter 15, verse 2. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge arise, but the mouth of the fools pours out foolishness. And the first part of verse 4. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. And therefore, the first thing you want to take, it, take, take care of and uh, take care of is your communication, your talking, your tongue. Wise in communication. I, innocent in character and industrious in caring. Innocent in character. No other man knows you. At least, uh, now that you are born again, now that you are a child of God, no other man knows you. You understand what it means? Knows you. No other man. You are innocent in character. Anywhere you are, innocency is your clothes. And you are industrious in caring for the home, for the house. If you are faithful in companionship. Still, if you are forgiven during conflict, there are the conflict at home a few times, but then you are forgiven. That's the F of your marriage. Forgiven during conflict and faithful in companionship. E, excellent in comfort and counsel. You see that your husband has any trouble. You are excellent for comfort. Excellent in comfort and excellent in counsel. And if we're like this, the husband will enjoy us. 
If husbands are like this, the wives will enjoy them. As we bring everything to a close, Luke chapter 6, verse 46. And why call ye me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Already we have learned many things today on the delicate position of headship at home. And uh, obviously we have many things to repent of, many things to present to the Lord. Many things we ought to tell the Lord, we're sorry for the way we're taking marriage. We now want to approach marriage in the proper way.